Okay, so here's my video on the MindLab Equinox 800. So I'm a little late with this video because it's been out for three years now, but as always, it's gonna be a complete video, which means by the time you watch this entire video, you'll know everything you need to know about this machine, especially if you're looking to buy one. So we'll go through the unboxing, we'll put it together in the assembly section, and then we'll turn it on and set it all up, give you some pro tips along the way. At the very end, I'll give you my final thoughts, and if you'll stick it out, I promise you, like I said, you'll know everything you need to know about this machine by the end of the video. But there will be timestamps down below if you just want to skip to any one certain part. Okay, so after about a 12 mile road trip up the hill, I went up to see my buddy Albert up there at the hardware store and got a brand new machine right off the shelf. Brand new in the box, ready to be taken out, get some treasure. All right, here we go. Gonna unbox the MindLab Equinox 800. Let's take a look at the box real quick. Park filled beach gold, multi IQ. Bunch of different features over here. Uh, you notice on here it says gold detecting mode. We'll talk more about that in a bit. High speed wireless audio. These two things right here alone are something that the Equinox 600 doesn't come with. There's some other features on here. On this end we have um, some accessories you can get. And by now it's been a few years, but all these accessories are all available. I know when it first came out, some of these were hard to find. The big coil, the small coil, and there's even aftermarket coils now. And it talks about the uh, different frequencies over here. You can see that it's adjustable between several different frequencies, but when it's in multi IQ mode, I'll tell you right now, if you're looking at possibly the differences between the 800 and the 600, when it's in multi IQ mode and it's running different frequencies all at the same time, which is multi frequencies, it's the same machine. The 600 and the 800 are spraying out all the same signals exactly the same. There are some other features that aren't available and we'll talk more about that later briefly but i just want to let you know right now the 800 and the 600 are all the same frequencies there are some updates that are out that you can update on here and it'll give you more ranges and more choices when you set the machine up to hunt in one particular frequency but when it's in multi-frequency it's, it's doing its own thing you can't control that or change that and the two machines are exactly the same as far as that goes Carrying on here, let's see, on this end, <clears throat> it says right here that uh, we know this is an Australian company with a lot of their corporate offices here in America, but it is an Australian company, but these are all manufactured in Malaysia, made in Malaysia. Some more details here, and look at the back. Wow, look at all the information on the back of this thing. That is awesome. I mean, if you're really thinking about getting one of these and you're in a store and you could take a look at the back of this, kind of tells you everything you need to know about whether or not you want to buy this machine if you don't know much about metal detectors. So a lot of great information on the back of this thing. Well, you can see that these, like a lot of the Mind Lab products, it's not sealed. So we'll just open it up. Uh, right away i know the dealer put a calendar in here so you can see it's 2022 now early 2022 so albert up there at the store gave us a free calendar which is really cool and uh that'll be fun to look at and put on the wall and stuff so nice touch by the dealer there oh look at this now this is something that i wish every manufacturer would do a carton contents list these are the things that should be in this box. Um, a lot of times you buy something and you're unboxing it, you don't even know if you really got everything or not, but this time we can use this as a checklist to make sure we have all these items. So that's really cool. And then information about charging the batteries are recommending that you use uh, their charger or a high quality two amp charger. And that's just a great idea to First of all, the, the machine does take quite a while to charge up completely. It's a lithium ion batteries and it's, um, it's quite the battery. So 
Anyway, I would make sure that you use uh, these recommendations on here about charging it and not just plugging it into, um, you know, any ordinary charger without taking the time to make sure that it's at least two amp capable or better. A couple more documents here. These are quick start guides, like we're starting to see in uh, all the newer MyLab stuff. These nice little quick start guides get you up and running right away, show you how to build it put it together and all the features you need to know just to get out there and get swinging right away. Good stuff and of course the owner's manuals on these are downloadable online like most of the new MyLab stuff and I would recommend that you do that. Go online and download the manual and print it even and read it. There's a lot of information in the manual that's not in here. Uh, detailed information you'll need to get the edge on the competition out there. Get everything you can out of the machine. So let's pull this coil out. You can see, first of all, before I pull the coil out, it's got cardboard, form cardboard in here. And um, I don't know what to say about that. I mean, it looks like it's, you know, uh, form fitted, so nothing's really moving around in there. And it's protecting it, but that's what you got. So no foam. Here's the controversial coil. Controversial because of these little ears right here, how thin they are. And uh, the fact that uh, there's a, a few different reasons these can break, but it's a known issue and no need to dig all that up again. We'll talk about it more later in this video and in two other videos. I'm going to do a video where I compare this to the 600 and I'm going to do a video where I give you some pro tips on it. And we'll talk about these ears right here, how to fortify and make them stronger and, and why they're breaking. But yeah, so this is the coil. It's about a pound. Actually, it's a little over a pound. I think it's uh, 18 ounces, if I'm not mistaken. Comes with the skid plate. My lab calls the coil cover a skid plate, form fitted. And uh, cable's okay, nothing too crazy. But uh, there's the coil, the 11 inch coil. And that's the only coil that this machine comes with in this box, with this configuration couple washers in here and the plastic nut and we'll talk more about the washers too something you need to know about these talk about that later Let's see what's in this box here oh all kinds of stuff all right so we have some cables here this is the uh, magnetic cable and what I mean by that is it magnetically snaps onto the back of the control head to charge the detector so it just kind of slaps up against there and um, I like the design um, I don't have any problem with it at all and uh, works good for me I was able to get one of these about six months before they hit the market and I had the rep come out Debbie and uh, me and my buddy Ron took these out and spent the day with them and swung them and then we bought them right away right the day they came out we had these and used them for quite a while um, I'm a big fan of the CTX 3030 and everybody that knows me knows that's my go-to machine so I don't really use these very much and um, just because they can't put the CTX down but uh, it's a fantastic machine and I like I said I've charged it many times and never had an issue with this style charging cable here's another one of the same exact cable so there's two of these in here I don't know if one of these is for the headphones and one's for the machine. We'll take a look in a minute and see. And the wireless module. This is the WM08 wireless module. And this allows it to speak to the machine wirelessly where you can plug your headphones in here, your regular headphones, and put this on your body and have your headphones here and keep it wireless from the machine. It'll talk to the machine with this. And I've also heard people use this with headphones and connect this to their phone not even the machine just to a phone and they can use a uh, because it's Bluetooth they can use a, uh, a regular set of audio file headphones to listen to music on their phone with just this not sure how that works but uh, a lot of people have done it and the arm cuff here let's take a look at that real quick again I've had a lot of experience with this machine and not a big fan of this arm cuff, but I will say that there are a couple aftermarket options out there for arm cuffs. 
Jeff Hertke makes a really good one. H-E-R-T-K-E. -E. Look him up online. It's definitely the arm cup that you want. It's uh, built to last and made of metal and stuff and lightweight. Just a great design on that. I would highly recommend you take a look at that. Got a uh, Velcro cable wrap, two of them in here. That's a nice touch to have those. And here's the pieces of the uh, arm cuff. And we'll get to that when we uh, go to assemble it, but super lightweight, plastic, and um, the base is rather small um, as far as lateral support. So you put it, put it down on a rock, it's likely just to fall right over. Um, and we'll get to that later. But there's that, it comes with one little screw to hold these together. And that's it for the box. We have some protective screen covers here in different languages. So there's basically every major language in the world is in here. You're able to uh, choose yours and apply it to the front. Um, Polish, Italian, Russian. I probably won't name them all off, but there's, uh, let's see, Mongolian, Turkish, Portuguese, Czech. So anyway, tons of them in here. Um, Chinese, Dutch, German. And of course, uh, anything that you probably would ever need in the world would be in here. And those go on the front of the control head in your language. And then the strap, Velcro strap for the arm cuff. When we get to the assembly, I'll show you how that works. Now let's pull the headphones out. I assume this is the headphones. Got some tape on the box here. Oh, I like the case. Look at this case. I forgot about that. That's a really nice uh, case on these uh, headphones. One thing I remember about these now that I'm looking at it, let's see if I'm right. I remember that there, yeah, there's a little pouch in here that's Velcro that you can move anywhere you want, really, but here's the best place so that it goes in the middle. But you got your cables in here to charge the headphones. So that's the cable to charge the headphones. We were talking about that earlier over here, but that is the cable. It's not one of those magnetic ones. And then a uh, regular cable that you can connect the headphones to the wireless module with this cable. It's an auxiliary cable, gold plated, uh, decent, you know, decent construction on that. Got a little rubber band here holding it together. I wouldn't say that it's military grade cable at all, but it looks pretty good, but you shouldn't really need that cable. You should be using it wirelessly. It shouldn't even be an issue. Got a little owner's manual in here. Nice. Full owner's manual on your headphones in here with instructions on how to pair it. And then the headphones. So there's like a uh, soft, thin leather kind of material up here. Synthetic, it's not leather, but it's padded though. It's very nice. Plasticky, very plasticky headphones, lightweight. And uh, the ear pads are the same material. Super comfortable. I remember wearing these and they were really comfortable. I didn't have any problem with those at all. We'll look at these closer uh, later in the video. There's the headphones. And you have to turn these little cups sideways when you go to fold this back up. So, that's really cool, that carrying case. Love it. And then we got the machine here. So, I remember when. Uh, when I got my brand new one, right when they first came out, that it was crazy dusty when I took it out of the box. And this one is too, but what I think it is maybe is just dust from this stuff, from this cardboard stuff, because it's just a fine, thin powder that looks like it's cardboard dust, but it's covered with a little bit of dust, no big deal. But um, it's got a nice, you know, thicker uh, handle on it. It's very ergonomic. 
I remember um, early on when I first started swinging these, they told us that uh, they didn't know in the original version that I had, an earlier version than this style, uh, what the handle, the final handle was going to be like. So this is a little bit different than what I first looked at. But when I got my first machine, um, not the tester machine, but the actual first machine, it had this style. And I had no issues with it at all. The machine does swing a little nose heavy, and we'll talk more about that later. But even with that having been said, it's, it's still a, a pretty a good handle and never really had any issues with it not feeling comfortable. So it's plastic, but it's got a, a rubberized coating on it. So hard plastic on the black parts and a softer rubberized gray parts. And it's got the screen protector on here. Yeah, let's see. So you got the speaker where the uh, magnetic attachment goes to charge a battery. Underneath this is a headphone jack to plug headphones in directly to the control housing. And this goes out to the coil. You got your little buttons on the side here. They're rubberized and they're um, tactile. You can feel them and they're clicky. So actually I take that back. They are not clicky. They're just tactile and rubber and they're not clicky. These are though, this is kind of a plasticky feeling and they got these little buttons that, that do, they are uh, clicky, but they're tactile as well. You can feel them with your fingers. They stick up a little bit. Um, that's about all there is to say about that. Got the little uh, holographic logo on here on your serial number. So cool. And then I think the only things left in here are these two shafts. Aluminum upper shaft and the lower shaft. I remember when the first early video started coming out, people were calling this plastic. And I even heard some people upset that this wasn't metal two things about that. Number one, it's not plastic. It's a spun carbon fiber based material that is crazy strong. It doesn't flex or bend whatsoever. It's a super strong material, not the carbon fiber that you might think about with the weave pattern all through it. It's a different style, but it's extremely strong and it's not plastic. This however is plastic down here at the end, but I've never heard of any issues with that at all. Um, super lightweight. Uh, the guys that were complaining that this wasn't metal, well, metal lower rods are not a good idea because you got a giant coil down here that's looking for metal. And you would never have a metal rod above a, a detecting coil. So manufacturers always make them out of non-metallic materials. So anyway, there's that. I think that's it for the box. Um, box still feels kind of heavy for some reason. I don't think there's anything else in here, but maybe it's just a very well-made box and that's the case yeah it's just this stuff is a little heavier anyway let's uh go ahead and put it together take a break for a second this segment is brought to you today by placerville hardware the first hardware store west of the mississippi located in beautiful and historic downtown placerville they feature a full selection of detectors, digging tools, and mining equipment. I'll tell you what, let's start with the coil over here. Unravel this cable. And straighten that out a little bit. So again, we'll talk quickly about these arms right here, these little coil cleats. We put these uh, rubber spacers in here in these little teardrop shaped recessed areas. I think a lot of the problems, there's various reasons, but a lot of the reasons why these break on people is over time detecting in sand and dirt sand and dirt get in here and wear these rubber pieces down so that they become so recessed that it's literally not sticking out anymore from the plastic. Then it becomes just plastic on plastic and it'd be no different than having 
uh, none of these in here. It'd be no different than just putting it in here like this if there's no rubber touching any, anywhere in there. And that happens pretty quick with sand and dirt rubbing on those. So what some people do is, there's a couple different companies out there online that sell thin washers that go between this rubber piece and the, the ear here. And the reason those thin washers help is because when the rubber pieces are out, these ears pull in and puts a pressure on the ears this way because the rubber is worn to grab the plastic. And then people start really over tightening this to make it s stick better because the rubber is worn and that causes the fatigue to come down in here and, and eventually crack these and break them. So the little thin washers that you put in first on the outsides, they go between here and here and here and here. Putting those aftermarket washers in there should help you from uh, getting in a situation where you have to pull the ears in ever. When you first put this together with the nice fresh rubber grommets in there, it's not really an issue, but I will tell you right now that more than any other detector you ever owned, I highly recommend that you do not over tighten this. Um, you can see as you start to tighten it, if you look down here, you'll see the ears start to come in right away. I'm already putting a lot of pressure on it right now. So just be careful with it. I don't know if my lab is going to do some different R&D on that and come up with a different design, but um, I'll talk about it in my next video in the pro tips and tricks where we change out the whole entire shaft system and do a couple other upgrades, including a counterweight. And one of the other upgrades that we'll talk about is another uh, option for fortifying these. There's a couple companies out there that make aftermarket parts that can make these even stronger. And it, actually there's several companies that do that. We'll talk more about that later, but for now we're gonna run it as we bought it. So I'm gonna bring this up here and kind of get it about right he here or so, so that when you bend it straight up, straight up in the air like this, you want to have it right up to the edge of the shaft there. I'll show you what I'm talking about here. There's two of these in here. Separate those. And there's a little piece in here you could pop out. Makes a hole here. And then you want the soft side out and the harder side in. And basically what you do is you put this around the cable like this so that the soft side's out. And you tighten that down and you leave it on the cable. That is going to stay on that cable forever. You're never going to put it onto here. It's going to stay right here onto this cable and be attached right here so it doesn't get lost. So the next thing is, is now that it lives on the cable, you bring it up here, and pull it around here so that it's straight up, and tighten this to the lower shaft. And just pull it across <clears throat> and let the Velcro grab. And the reason you want to have it straight up and down when you put this on is so that when you pull it down a little bit, it has a little bit of bend in it here, a nice soft bend, so that when you, if you ever do lift it up this way, you don't start pulling hard on this and bending it over. In fact, you also want to be careful that you don't go too far the other way. And because uh, this Velcro cable is holding this pretty good and it's, you know, it's rubber and it's grippy. So just be careful about that. Don't put too much stress on this boot right here. But that's how I recommend you do it. And so we're done with that. This other piece here, we'll uh, put it up a little bit higher on the cable and we'll do the same thing. We'll run it around the cable and it'll stay on the cable. We'll do that in a second. All right, next thing I wanna talk about here, again, an aftermarket company um, that I can recommend is a, a guy named Jeff Hertke, I think is his name. And he makes a, uh, a better version of this design, in my opinion. But uh, this one's just fine for most people. But like I said, you set this down in rocks, and I'll demonstrate that later. And uh, if you get this little short base on something, the weight of all this up here causes the machine to tip over. So you can see what I did is I chose the last hole for me. This is adjustable. You can put it in any one of these holes here. You can see that little 
metal grommet there. It can snap into any one of these holes here. I'm gonna put it on the last one. And then this piece here, doesn't matter which way it goes, but just goes right over the top. Let me thumb screw, tighten that in. Done. So yeah, see the weight of the head up here, and you got this little base, you can see it's real tippy. And you put it up on a little rock right here and it's already wanting to fall. So one of the other companies that, that makes a different design for this, like the guy talked about, it's a wider base and it's metallic too. So if you're right-handed, when you put this Velcro on and you're right-handed, you wanna start on the inside. So the left side, inside, and you wanna take, there's a thicker piece and a thinner piece. You wanna take the thinner piece with the grippy part up and run it from the inside. So if you're right-handed for me, I'm coming from this side. Run it across, go through both holes, and just keep pulling, and it'll stop, automatically just stop right here as it grabs this thick part, won't go through. So it'll just stop right there. And that's all you need to do to set the Velcro for the arm cuff. And you can see here that uh, for any typical arm, you gotta bring this out quite a ways. And then when you come back across this way, there's not a lot to grab right here, you see that? I mean, it's for an arm like mine or you get your jacket on or something, I'm almost out of grab there. So that's another feature on the other optional uh, aftermarket parts for this is that the uh, Velcro arm piece is a little bit longer and more appropriate for you know somebody with arms like mine or like I said, you got a jacket. You don't have to worry about that running out of Velcro there. So there's that. The next thing we'll do is put this in. You can see that there's a hole down here and you got this little guy here. So it goes in this way, upside down. And just uh, what am I doing wrong here? There we go. Okay, it snapped in there and you just tighten this a little bit. It doesn't take much to tighten that down. I mean, not even an eighth of a turn and it's tight and I wouldn't over tighten that. There's no need to over tighten that ever. Just barely tighten it, that's all you need. And we're almost there. Same thing with this one. It's on the bottom. By the way, real quick, the front of the coil is where it says EQX11. So, Mind Lab always has their their inside logo going out but that's how the coil goes just like that that's the correct way to put the coil on that's the front this is the back I'll start this down the shaft here push the button in on the bottom and you can see there's multiple adjustments for length on here I'm six foot two I'm gonna leave it all the way out and then we're just gonna Carefully run this cable around like this. Until we get to right about here. I don't know if that's one one wrap too many. I think it is. Let's go back off one. This little piece in here can only go in one way. You, uh, you have to kind of just turn it until it drops in and it eventually will drop in and then just turn the metal collar, finger tighten that. Again, no need to over tighten that at all. We're gonna take this last little strap right here and it's gonna live up on this part right here. Just like before, soft side out, bring that down, tighten it nice and tight. Speaking of nice and tight and uh, Slide it down to where it touches the metal already, which is right here. And then go ahead and, again, leave the soft side out. And go ahead and put this on here like this. And that way this shouldn't have to have any strain pulling on it ever when you're loosening it or tightening it or the shaft here. You got this one to protect here and this one to protect here, so. There it is, ready to go. And uh, 
The only other thing I could recommend is you change your faceplate if you need to, pull this off and make sure you're all charged up. Tell you what, we'll take another little break and see you guys in a bit and we'll start talking about how to set it up. Okay, gonna show you how to power it on and power it off and then we'll do a factory reset on the machine. To turn it on, this red button right here on the side, this little rubber button right here. You just hold that in until you see the display. And there, the display is already doing something. And you wait for that noise right there and you're ready to go. To shut it off, just push this button for a second and it's off. There you go. To do a factory reset on the machine, you'll see when you hold this button in and keep it held in, push and hold, you'll see the letters FP and that stands for factory presets. So it's completely resetting the machine back to brand new factory settings. And there you go, ready to go. Okay, I'm gonna show you guys how to do a noise cancel. And I'm showing you that first because that's really the first thing that you wanna do when you get to a site to do some metal detecting. You wanna do a noise cancel and let the machine choose the quietest channel it can operate on. So we'll power it on. Like we just got to our detecting site here. And this little setup cog wheel right here. When you touch that, you'll see that it automatically drops an icon down to the bottom down here. And as I push it, it toggles across. And I like how Mind Lab did this. They put noise cancel first and then ground balance second. Those are the first two things you wanna do before you even start operating this machine. So let's go back to noise cancel. To perform our noise cancel, super easy. Just lift the machine up so that it's at belt height sticking out in front of you. Tap this black button over here once and wait five seconds. And there it is. You can see that it shows channel zero. It might be different for you. I know that uh, here in my neighborhood, I'm right in front of my house, there's underground wiring and networks and all kinds of stuff that it's getting interference from. So it shows this channel to be the quietest. If you're out with buddies and they have the same machine or other machines that are interfering with you, one of you might try to do a noise cancel to see if the machines can stay away from each other and quiet down a little bit. Uh, once you get this done and it shows channel zero, just tap the pinpoint button once and you're ready to go ready to swing, except for one thing, which is ground balance. Let's talk about that now. Okay, so you got noise canceled done now. You ready to do a ground balance? You hit this little setup cog wheel and toggle over to the second one here. If you're over here somewhere, just keep pushing it. It'll come back. Get to ground balance here. And when you're here, you have a few options. To manually change this number to whatever you want, you can just go up and down right now to whatever value you want. And I will tell you in this mode, a very popular setting all around the world, especially in the gold fields, is to run this machine at a zero and also at the beach too, to run it at a ground balance of zero. So let's go down to zero. If that's how you wanna do it, you just get to zero and then tap this button once and you're manually in zero right now and often detecting at that setting. A couple other options though, is if you wanna let the machine decide what number it thinks it should be at, you, and it, it'll actually change as you're encountering different soil types, the machine will be listening and suggesting different numbers and changing itself. And this all happens behind the scenes. You won't notice that. And some people say that affects depth. So it may not always be the right setting for you. So to do it though, we'll hit the cog wheel, go back to this icon down here for ground balance and tap this black one over here to check mark once. And you'll see this little squiggly line in the top right corner up here. And that icon is telling you right now that it's an auto tracking ground balance. So if I go up and down here a couple times before I hit the pinpoint button, it likes a value of two at my front yard. It, it doesn't like zero, it likes two right now. So there's two and to leave it in that mode, just tap this button here and you're off and running in a auto tracking ground balance mode and it will change as you encounter different soils. So the next thing you have an option to do here is I want to change, now that we know my front yard is two, I'm going to go here and manually change it to a new number, like let's say 14. So right now it's in 14 manual. You'll notice that the little squiggly lines up here are not on. And what we're going to do now is we're going to do ground balance and hold this one down. And we're holding it down over here. 
We're gonna go up and down and look at the number change quickly. And it settled it too. And your, your number may be different, but watch when it finally settles down, you can let go. And now the machine is ready to go at a two and it, it, it actually listened and suggested the right channel for you to be at. And then you hit this button, you're off and running. No squiggly line up here anymore. So you put it at two, it's gonna stay at two, but it liked two when you did this. So those are the three options. You change it to what you want or let it listen and leave it at that number. Or if you choose to put it in auto, you have the little squiggly lines. Again, just go over here, tap this once and it's an auto. And that's, that's all you have it to the uh, ground balance. I will say there's a little more to it than that. There is some optimal settings and you're gonna wanna check your owner's manual for that or check out my next video on pro tips and tricks. That video will be about a week after this one. So subscribe to the channel if you want and you'll get a notification and a link right to that video. But uh, for now, just to keep this video short, not gonna talk much more about that. And we'll move on to the next thing, which will be volume. To adjust the volume, pretty simple. Again, cog wheel down here for setup. Go over to the third one. And here we have volume down and up. And you can hear it getting louder right now. It goes to a value of 25 at max. And this affects the volume that you hear right now from the speaker out here. And it also affects the volume in the headphones. So that's uh, something that you want to change depending on your situation. And once you're ready, just hit this button down here, volume done. All right, let's talk about threshold now. Threshold is the fourth icon on the bottom down here. Let's hit the setup cog wheel here and toggle over to the fourth one. And I wanna tell you right now that you can set the threshold right here, but there is a sub menu for threshold. If I hold this down, you'll see the little line on the bottom appears and you see a PT on here. We'll talk more about that mode later, but right now let's put it back, hold this to just regular threshold so I can show you how to set the threshold. What you do here is, right now it's at zero and the machine is perfectly quiet. You can't hear any noise coming from the machine at all right now. And if we raise this number over here up, you'll start to hear a tone come out. It's a constant tone. You start to hear it now. If I put it at full volume, it's pretty annoying. You got that constant tone and we'll go ahead and hit this and we'll detect with this constant tone on I'll throw a quarter down real quick and you can hear, you still hear the quarter, but the tone is so loud that you could barely hear the quarter. So let's go to that again and turn that down to 18 and then we'll turn it back on. Now the quarter is louder than the threshold. You never want your threshold too loud, but threshold is a very important tool with this machine. And I'll talk way more about that in my pro tips and tricks video. And you're gonna wanna watch that video just for the threshold part because there's a very powerful way you can use that to do better with this machine. So I highly recommend you watch that video just for that alone. Anyway, that's how you set, you set the threshold is uh, go to the fourth icon, up or down on volume. And when you're ready, wherever you like it, you just hit this button and you're running with the threshold. Okay, I'm gonna turn the threshold back down to zero just so we can hear what we're doing here. There we go. Now I'm gonna show you uh, the next icon over which is target tone. We hit the cog wheel till we get to target tone. And when we're here, you can see there's only four values. Right now it's on a value of 50, and then you have five, two, and one. Let's start with one so I can tell you how this works. With a value of one, I'm gonna hit this button down here and we're detecting right now with a value of one for target tone. And you can see I have some coins down here, I have a US penny and it makes that tone. That's the same exact tone the nickel's gonna make, and the quarter and the half, because it's only in one tone setting. It's gonna make the same tone for everything you listen to that's being detected. It's all gonna have the same tone. Let's go to the other end of the spectrum to really show you the difference here. And we'll go up to 50 and hit this button to detect. And now a penny sounds like this, but a nickel, sounds like this. Penny, nickel, quarter, and half. Even a half and a quarter sound different. Because the scale now has 50 different tones from every 
thing that it can detect on this end up to this end. So when the half dollar comes in way up here, you can see it's the last segment on here. It's giving you the, almost the 50th tone that it has, the, the highest tone that it can make. But the nickel comes way down here at 13. So 13 sounds like that, but 33 sounds like that. So that's pretty much self-explanatory that the other two settings now are five. So you have five different tones now. And this five and two are something that you can, well, you can set all the tones from one, two, and five. But let's say five, for example, you have it set on five. And you're detecting this way. There's some little Vs up here you'll see in the scale. And anything in this section, anything down here sounds like one tone. Another one here, and you can see it's split into five parts. So a penny sounds like this, but a nickel still sounds different. And that sounds different than this. But it's only got five different tones that it can listen to instead of hearing all 50. So for more information on that, check out my next video on the pro tips or uh, go online and look at the owner's manual and read all about the different tone ID settings. But uh, for right now, we'll just keep it simple and you can see there are only four values. All right, let's talk about accept and reject now. It's the second to the last icon down here. Toggle to it. It's got a little check mark and a little X down there. And what that is, let's get out of here real quick, is I'm in 50 tone right now and you can hear the penny and you can see it's a 21. And nickel's a 13, sounds different. Quarter's 30 and half's 33. Let's say you're out detecting and you don't want to find any pennies and no nickels. You just want the good stuff. You want the quarters and the halves and the dimes. So what you could do is you could tell the machine that you want to ignore 13 and 21. And the way you do that is you hit the cog wheel till you get over to here. And when you're here, you can do the plus and minus signs to any value you want. We're going to go to 13 first and we're going to hit this check mark and that blocked out 13. So now 13 is not going to be heard. And we can also, while we're here, go up to 21 and do the same thing. And now we'll, we'll block out, we'll discriminate out 13 and 21. And we hit this button and we're detecting now and we're ignoring pennies, ignoring nickels. But listen to this, the good stuff still comes in. You need to get gas money quick. That's how you, how you do it. You ignore your nickels and pennies, but when you do that, of course, you're missing all kinds of other stuff. But that's the way you can use accept and reject to reverse it. Pretty simple. Go back into here and you're on 21. Uncheck it. Go down to 13 and uncheck it and hit this button to detect. Now you'll hear your pennies and nickels again. There you go. And we're at the last icon on the bottom down here, which is recovery speed. Let's toggle over to that real quick. And it's at a seven, a value of seven. It goes from one up to eight. So you have one to eight. And what that means is the lower settings, as they're lower, require a little bit slower swing speed. And what you get for swinging a little bit slower with a slow recovery speed is more depth. And the problem with that is if you're trying to get more depth and there's a whole bunch of targets all around that penny and there's nails and everything else, with a slow recovery speed, with a low setting and a slow swing, yes, you're gonna hear that penny way deeper, but you're also more likely to have the machine not hear the penny because it's so slow. It's only focusing on depth, not target separation at this point. And what you're doing is the nails around that penny may allow that penny to not even be heard because you're at such a slow, a, uh, such a slow operating um, recovery speed. So. If you go the other direction with it, all the way up to eight, you can swing a little faster and you can hear that penny in with all the other nails and you can just get in there surgically and hear, oh, there's a high tone in all these nails in here. And that'll help you. But the problem is you're not gonna hear that penny as deep as you would have at a lower number here. So a good setting for you to kind of start off with, I would suggest is just four and to just go to four and hit enter. And that's kind of a, a balance between both. But for more information on how to use that to your advantage, again, check out my next video on pro tips and tricks. We'll talk more about that and how you can set it up to uh, work in, to your advantage in your situation. I'll tell you what, I'm gonna turn my backlight on because it's getting a little dark out here. 
Talk about the modes real quick. You can see these things across the bottom here. These indicate what mode you're detecting in right now. And to change the mode, if you hit this button here, you'll see it went to two. Hit it again, it goes to the next mode. One, two, one, two, and one, and two. So I'm toggling through these with this button here. Right now we're in park mode one. And park mode has a little tree there and a little park bench. Uh, that's for deep coins and high trash. And that means like, you know, a lot of uh, coins that are deep that have been in the park in the old park for a long time, but there's a bunch of bottle caps and pull tabs and everything else up on top of the coins. This would be a good setting for you if you're trying to find deep coins and high trash. But if you're trying to find smaller coins and jewelry, like earrings and necklaces and stuff like that, a better setting would be part two. If you're in the park and you're trying to find, again, small coins and jewelry, there you go, that's part two. There's more to it than that, but that's generally speaking, that's how MindLab wants you to look at these. The next one over here is a field mode. And you see the windmill back there in the fields. You got a plowed field out in England or something, or you're out here in California with me in the, the gold country where the miners were at during the California gold rush, 1850s. And you're out in the fields and you're trying to find stuff that they dropped a long time ago. And you're looking for it to be down deep well, field mode one is good for deep relics. And then if you're trying to find stuff that's smaller, smaller relics, like small cuff buttons and things like that, you're gonna miss them if you're in the deep relic program. But if you go to field two, you may hear the smaller stuff, the small gold. You may even pick up a gold nugget. Hey, out here, I'm where the miners were because the miners were here digging gold. So they were always camped right at gold. So there's a good chance that I might find gold while looking for their relics. So for me, this mode might be the, the mode that I want to be in. And then you have the next set over is beach. You got the little palm tree and the sun there and the water. Beach one is for wet and dry sand, but mostly just when you're up in the sand. And then beach two is when you're underwater or standing in the surf. And in the surf, I don't know if you've ever detected at a beach before, but the surf kind of rolls right at the edge and it depends on, you know, how high the tide is, but the heavies kind of just stay in a trough right there where the surf comes in and rolls. And if you look down in the water where it's crashing, you'll see a circular motion of all the rocks and pebbles down there. And that's where the rings are at and the coins and stuff. So a lot of beach detectorists get down in the uh, water at about waist deep and they get in the trough down there in the wet water, this would be the setting they'd want to be on. And it has something to do with black sand and the fact that water has salt in it and when you're at the ocean and salt is, uh, is detected on the machine. So when the water is moving and it's, you know, you're underwater and it's moving, the machine likes a different setting, which would be beach two. So let's go over here to the gold mode. Gold mode one is just for normal ground where you don't have uh, a lot of mineralization and you're um, you're dealing with small nuggets. You want to hear the fine stuff, and you know there's also mode one is good for hot rocks too. If you're encountering a lot of hot rocks, you'll notice that mode one seems to ignore the hot rocks better than mode two. And then you have uh, the second setting here, which is gold two, and gold two is for deeper nuggets in difficult ground. And what that means is that there's a you know you're in red soil in Australia or out here where I'm at where we have blood red soil which because of the amount of iron in the soil. The machine likes to run at gold to around that real difficult ground. And again, if you're trying to find the deeper nuggets, which would be bigger typically than the small stuff, which is right on top. Gold two would be your setting, but I gotta tell you, if you're gonna run in gold two, you have to swing slowly. If you're ever running in gold two and you're trying to find nuggets, you never wanna gonna, gonna wanna swing much faster than just this right here. This is about the speed you'd have to be in to hear deep gold nuggets in that mode. If you're swinging like this and you're in mode two, you're going to miss everything. So just something to keep in mind there. But there's your, your different modes. Uh, the one mode that I didn't talk about um, is all metal mode, and it's the horseshoe down here. And you can see right now that this whole section out here is whited out, and there's nothing being detected down here right now. The machine will ignore anything that comes in on the scale at these numbers down here. So what we can do is tap this once, 
and now we're in all metal mode. It will hear everything in that, where you're at. And you could hear in my front yard, there's a lot of noise here in my front yard. All kinds of iron and, you know, staples and who knows what, roofing nails and everything else. So for me to be in all metal mode, it's there's a lot of ear fatigue with that. But some users find that uh, in all metal mode, they can hear every single nail and every single piece of iron. And sometimes in the middle of all those little grunts, they hear just a little squeaker in there. And some detectorists find it valuable to hunt in all metal mode if you can handle the fatigue of all those signals coming into your ears at once. Definitely advanced detecting, big leagues for um, anyone who wants to go out and spend five or six hours swinging this machine with all that sound coming in. You're gonna find stuff that everybody else misses, but it's gonna be a, a, a hard day of uh, ear fatigue for you. So. That's all metal mode. To get out of that, we just tap it again and we're back in discriminating everything out down here. All right, let's talk about pinpoint now. To pinpoint your target before you dig it, this white button right here is your pinpoint mode. And we used that button a lot earlier just to get out of the menu. But while you're detecting, I'm in park one right now and i am got my pinpoint right here. So I got a, in my front yard, I have a signal right here that I've never dug. It's probably gonna be a dime. It's a 20, 526 on here and it's down about two inches and I've just never dug it. I left it there because I like that it's there for demonstration purposes. So let's do pinpoint on that. Before I dig this, I like that it's repeating in this direction. I recommend that you always turn 90 degrees and recheck it. If it's still repeating, you got to dig that. It's a nice stable number and it repeats on a 90. So next thing we're going to do is pinpoint it now. We'll just tap this button right here, and it's in pinpoint mode right now. And you can hear audibly when it's right on it as you move up and down and left and right. And look at your meter up here too. When it's fully black, you're right on it. It's right in the center of the coil. Right there. And to get out of that, just tap the button again, and you're back in the regular mode. And that's all there is to pinpointing. All right, I'm going to talk about sensitivity now. Sensitivity is... Um, how sensitive the machine is to a target at depth. And when you turn sensitivity down, the machine can uh, hear something right near the coil. And as you turn sensitivity up, it'll seek even deeper into the ground and hear the deeper stuff. But the problem is, is when you run your sensitivity too high on really any metal detector in terrible ground where you have a lot of EMI or more common than that, a lot of minerals in the ground. A high sensitivity is very noisy and chatty and the machine just kind of makes a lot of false noise that you don't need to hear. So running a high sensitivity is not always a good option. But to set it, it's pretty simple. Right now the machine is just in operational mode and the minus sign and the plus sign are right now your sensitivity. I don't have to go to any icon. So I have a sensitivity of one right now and you can hear that I can't hear that penny very good right here. But as I go up to, let's say, 20, listen now. Now I can hear the penny at depth. Again, we'll stay at the same depth and we'll bring it down. And we lost it. Sensitivity of one, I can't hear it anymore. Go to the half dollar. I can hear it here at about three inches with a one setting. But as I come up, to the 20. Listen, I can hear it way up here now. So that's how sensitivity works. The reason I went to 20 is that's not the bottom. It, it can go all the way up to 25. But I personally, very few times ever, am able to run it at 25, and you're hearing exactly why right now. You hear all that noise? Let's bring it down till that noise kind of goes away. And you'll notice that right around 20, it settles down. Most detectorists and most ground all around the world find that somewhere between 18 and 22 is about where they run the machine on sensitivity. Very rarely will you get pristine ground with not much mineralization, no EMI in the area, no other machines around you, where you can run this thing fully cranked up at 25 quietly. And so you have to kind of figure out where you want to be with sensitivity, but again, to set it, it's just right now, even in operational mode, just up and down on the arrows and that's your sensitivity.
That was a long video and I apologize for that. If you've made it to this point, I commend you for staying with me for 55 minutes or however long it was. And I'll tell you, we just touched on the basics, guys. There's so much more to say about this machine. I can't put it all in one gigantic video, so we're gonna have to break it up a little bit over about three or four videos. But you know, today we went and bought the machine, unboxed it, and put it all together, and I showed you all the basic settings, the things that you kinda need to know to get going out there in the field today, you know, day one, stuff you need to know. And, but there's a lot more to it. There's way more advanced techniques. There's more advanced settings. And as I promised you several times in this video here, I'm gonna do a pro tips video, which I promise will be pretty short. But it'll, you know, it's the kind of stuff that you won't find in the owner's manual. And it'll give you a little bit of an advantage out there in the detecting fields, tips that will help you just get an edge. So there's all that. And then um, I've already put a video out, and you can see that right here. This video shows you some upgrades to the machine that we did where we put a nice carbon fiber shaft on one and a new arm cuff and a couple other little uh, upgrades to it. But um, go ahead and watch that if you want. And um, we're kind of skipping ahead by watching that video. But anyway, so this is the first part of, you know, three or four videos I'll do on this machine here. And I'm gonna say that, uh, you know, in my final remarks, this machine is just unbelievable. Outstanding for the money that you're spending on this machine, which is, you know, just under $1,000. You can't get much better. And you know, there's uh, at that price point, it's kind of the king. There's nothing else out there that is at this level and this price point. There are a few things, you know, that, that could go head to head with it uh, when you start getting into the CTX 3030 and you know, the Deus 2 and, and the uh, Notka Macro Legend, some of those machines. But at this price point, this guy's king, in my opinion, right now, 2022, this is the king still. And I'll tell you another thing too about this machine that I figured out. When it comes to gold nuggets, wow. This thing is seriously impressive in gold. And you know, I got my, uh, where is it? My, my uh, Gold Monster 1000 over here. And I love that. I got my 6000. I had the 7000 for a while. And it was, it was tough to hunt with. It's, it's a beast, super heavy. But this thing is um, very impressive in this class. Nothing's gonna touch this in VLF world for gold uh, that's a all around detector. This thing is just killer on gold nuggets. I mean, just so impressive to us. And I know a couple guys that swing just this machine looking for gold. And the, the benefit of that is, is like we've talked about before, this machine around iron and in the fields where there was gold miners living and working, you got rusty nails all over the place and bits of iron and stuff. And those fancy machines like the 6,000 and the 7,000 are kind of crippled in there because they hear all that iron and you're digging small nails and staples and boot tacks where this thing will discriminate all that out and just bang on the gold. So it has its place out there in the gold fields just like the Gold Monster 1000 does. But anyway, as a final wrap, I love the build quality, love the company, love the machine. And like I said, at this price point, highly recommend it to you. Uh, if you have the money to spend to get the 800 over the 600, again, highly recommend that just because of the added benefits that we kind of talked about in this, uh, in this video here. So anyway, there you go for my uh, first video on the Equinox 800 and watch for a couple more coming real soon. And we'll catch you guys later and good luck out there.